Climate change is also worrying us because we're looking at extreme weather events. So extreme weather is when a weather event goes beyond what we expect. Now, the interesting thing is if there was a hurricane in Antarctica, now it's not going to happen because it's in the wrong place, but if a hurricane did happen in Antarctica, we really wouldn't care because there's no people living there, there's no property, and so therefore the interaction between humans and the weather isn't important. What we are worried about is where there are people, the actual baseline, how we predict climate, is starting to change. What we all forget about is that, of course, every society has what I call the coping range. So, for example, in the UK, um, temperatures above 26 degrees Celsius, which is about 88 degrees Fahrenheit, we start to have heat-related deaths. Now, of course, here in Florida, um, that's called spring, okay? So again, different societies have different sort of uh, coping zones. And what happens is, as climate changes underneath, those extreme events seem to become more common because they actually start to go beyond the ability of that society to cope. An example of this is the floods that happened in Louisiana in 2016. Now, of course, studies by uh, NOAA suggest that these floods are now twice as likely to occur because of climate change, which means that we have to adapt our society to be able to cope with those increased floods. If we look at California, the drought of 2013 and 14 was extreme, but we know that these are going to become more likely. So what we have to do is adapt each of the societies to be able to cope with a greater range of natural variation. And that's something that people forget about climate change. They see the long-term trends, but they don't see that actually what really affects humans is not the average temperature or the average rainfall. It's the extreme events, whether it's heat waves, whether it's droughts, or whether it's floods. In many ways, climate change is about too much or too little water. We see that we are worried about uh, flooding, sea level rise, but we also on the other side we're worried about too little water. We're looking in a future whereby perhaps one and a half billion people will become water stressed. And we find that it's not just the countries in say the tropics in say sub-Saharan Africa, but we're also looking at countries such as the United Kingdom and in parts of the United States, whereby the water that we expect normally is suddenly shrinking. And somehow we need to adapt to actually produce enough water for the humans that are actually living in that area. And these can be predicted. We are using models for the future to give policymakers some idea of the range of uh, warming, the range of rainfalls, what are likely to happen with extreme events. So different countries and governments can start to predict and to adapt and also help to protect their population. We call this adaptation because unfortunately climate change is going to occur even if we do everything we can now, we're still looking at perhaps two degrees warming by the end of the century, which will mean there is climate change. So therefore, governments must be mandated to adapt to help protect their populations from the worst effects of climate change. Climate change also affects people's health. Now, I was very fortunate in 2009, I was part of a multidisciplinary team with engineers, medics, lawyers, climatologists that worked on the Lancet Commission. And we were looking at the interaction between climate change and global health because there's been huge advances in health uh, around the world over the last 50 to 60 years. But a lot of this could be undone by climate change. So let's have a look at it. So for us, the most important thing about health is access to clean water and food. Now, climate change threatens that. So if we look at water, we know that some areas could get more water, but in short, intense bursts, other areas are going to get less water. So we need to be able to manage that lack of water or too much water at the wrong times to be able to store it safely to allow people to still continue to have clean, fresh drinking water. 
Of course, water is absolutely essential for agriculture. And so therefore, if we don't manage the water in these areas and the changing availability of water, we won't be able to manage food production. Now, food production is absolutely essential, and most of the food in the world is produced by small farm holders. Now, the interesting thing is the Green Revolution that occurred in the 60s and 70s, which revolutionized food production in Southeast Asia and South America, meant that small farmers were able to produce enough food to feed themselves, but also to sell food on to the local towns, the villages, and the cities. And many people, about half the population of the world, were actually fed by this system. The big worrying thing is that in the tropics, if climate change does accelerate, we have conditions whereby it is too hot and too humid to work outside. There is a physiological limit whereby it is impossible to do heavy agricultural work outside. Now, we seem to forget this sometimes uh, in Europe and in the United States because, of course, when we're farming and we're out uh, in our farms, we have air-conditioned tractors. And so, therefore, we can actually work in all conditions, whatever the temperature, whatever the actual humidity. But actually, majority of the farmers in the world that produce the food for the very poorest people, the bottom th uh, three and a half billion, they work outside. So, the interesting thing is that when we looked at the health effects of climate change, food production and food security were really important and we're very worried about in 50 years time whether enough food will be able to be produced because we're losing all those days when people simply cannot go outside to actually work. The problem with food production and predicting it into the future is that climate change is only one of the issues facing food production. People seem to forget that actually when you have starvation and you have famines, actually it's not always a lack of food that's caused that. It's about a lack of money. So again, one of the most upsetting things is when the Ethiopians had those droughts and huge famines in the 1980s. When they first started off, there was grain still in the villages and in the towns, but the farmers whose crops had failed had no money to buy food. So the problem here when we talk about climate change and its adverse effect on food production, one of the key things here is, well, how does the World Trade Organization, how does international trade and food actually get distributed? I'll give you an example. The majority of uh, countries in Europe import a huge amount of food. They also export it. And so if a crop fails, say, in the United Kingdom or in the United States, you just go onto the international market and you buy food in because you have the money to buy that food. What is interesting and important is how do we have food security? So India has tried to push through a set of laws because they want to protect their food production. What they want to be able to do is say to all their small farmers, which they have many, many millions, and say, look, okay, we want you to produce food, we're going to give you a fair price for your food, okay, so therefore you still have money, you can still buy extra food, and you're not going to starve. So we'll buy that food. We will then subsidize that food and sell it at a subsidized rate to people who cannot afford food, so we actually do not have starving people. It's a wonderful idea, happened post-war in many countries after the Second World War to actually produce, uh, protect foods and actually allow food to be given out to everybody so there wasn't starvation. However, the World Trade Organization has taken uh, India to their courts, uh, led by the United States, because of course this is a uh, protected uh, um, sort of uh, business. How can you do that? Because then other international uh, companies can't sell food into that market because the Indians are protecting and subsidizing food prices. So we then have this real problem here about whether international trade or protecting a population from starvation is more important. And the problem is with the weight of uh, transnational corporations and big heavyweight uh, Western countries, sometimes, unfortunately, the trade option wins over the protection. And we need to start looking at these things, particularly as climate change starts to get more intense in the future, about changing this balance. And that sometimes world trade is not the most important thing, but protecting the food and water 
of a population to prevent starvation is perhaps more important.